And then it wasn't until I moved to Seattle and joined the Seattle Front Runners, which is a, in a, an LGBTQIA plus running and walking club, where I finally realized that this thing to me that was always this individual sport or this individual activity could be done with a community, could be done as a group. And you know, a group that affirms and, uh, you know, encourages you and cheers you on, no, you know, no matter who you are, what your gender identity is, or your sexual orientation is, right? Like, we see all of those different identities coming into this space, and we celebrate those. We we encourage folks to to bring those and, and live and, and exist authentically in those spaces. Hello and welcome to another episode of Running Tales, the podcast which tells the extraordinary stories of everyday runners. My name's Craig Lewis and this week's guest is Jake Federowski, a non-binary person who's working to increase inclusivity in running. Jake is the author of The Guide to Non-Binary Inclusion in Running, which they created after deciding to no longer register or participate in races that didn't affirm their gender identity. They also founded Run Beyond, a community for non-binary athletes to connect, as well as being the executive director of the Queer Running Society, which campaigns for queer representation in the industry and aims to connect queer running communities. We talked about Jake's own journey of discovery and how they struggled to find their place in the world of sport as a child, but thrived after starting running with Seattle Frontrunners, a running and walking club for the LGBTQIA plus community. But I started our conversation by asking Jake to explain exactly what being non-binary means. Thank you so much for, for asking that question because I think it's always a good place to start. For me, the way that I typically look at gender and sex assigned at birth um, is that they are two different things. Um, and this is something that is <laughs> very common, commonly known. Um, but most of the time when you think about sex assigned at birth, you think of male, female, intersex. Um, and that is more tied to biological uh, indicators. And then you have uh, gender, which is broken down into gender identity and gender expression. Um, the expression side of it is obviously kind of the more physical attributes or the behavioral attributes of how you or how how your gender um, or how you embody that gender. Uh, but gender identity is that more innate feeling, is that internal sense of who you are um, and your um, your your space uh, or sorry the, the way that you take up space in society. Typically, then, when you look at gender identity, it's broken down into cisgender and transgender folks. And cisgender is just the word that we use to uh, to refer to folks whose gender identity directly correlates with the sex that was assigned at birth. So man, woman, uh, or sorry, cis men and cis women. Um, and then you have trans folks on the other side, which is folks who, you know, their, their gender is not directly correlating with what the sex was assigned at birth or the sex that was assigned at birth. And many times people think of trans and, and kind of the, the history of that word is that it comes from this place of, you know, uh, trans women and trans men. Um, we have to get to a place where trans women and trans men are just women and men, right? And, and in, the, in the bucket of men and women, we have cis men and we have trans men and in the bucket of, of women we have cis women and trans women right but the the part that gets a little bit more tricky is that when you start to think of non-binary folks um these are this is kind of an umbrella term that i use um it kind of it varies a little bit depending on who's using it but non-binary folks are anyone whose gender identity falls outside or in between the gender binary of men or women many folks will think of non-binary as a trans identity because it, that identity isn't tied to the sex that was assigned at birth. But some folks try to keep the two separate. Um, I think, you know, it, it kind of depends on who you speak to, but I would say overall, non-binary folks are those that are that identify outside of the gender binary of men and women and in theory that is also then considered a trans identity because it's not directly tied to the sex that was assigned at birth yeah well, i think that's a that's a really clear explanation but but i, I kind of guess here you know you get weird stereotypes and weird um, ideas coming up sometimes around things like people who are non-binary are intersex, which I know isn't true, or people who are non-binary are some kind of 
different version of a I don't know drag queen or something because that's what all mm. that's what all queer people are or people who are non-binary are I don't know asexual or or whatever that there's a lot of odd theories go around and none of them are true are they well I think you know what you just kind of mentioned there specifically intersex and asexual you know, specifically intersex is, is specifically about your sex, right? It's that biological um, sex that is, once again, assigned at birth. I'm going to continue to say assigned at birth because it's literally, you know, put upon children as they are born by doctors uh, and uh, their parents. But we have to we have to recognize that those are two separate things. Like, once again, sex and gender are two different things. And so making that direct correlation can get kind of complicated. And and then, you know, when you talk about asexual, that's talking about like sexual orientation, right? Which is a whole new thing. And that has to get at who you are attracted to, who you are, who you are seeking um, relationship with, right? Uh, or more intimate relationships with, I should say. Um, and that gets into, you know, gay, lesbian, queer, asexual, bisexual, right? That list goes on forever as well. So you can be one and more of these things but you know making blanket statements that all what i can't remember what you said but like all non-binary people are intersex or all non-binary people are asexual like that there's no uh truth to that because it's just this wild spectrum of many identities and they (laughs) all are you know crossing over each other and um it's really kind of exciting to me like i don't know it's it's fun to like really get to know different people and all the different identities that that they uh, are made up of because that's what makes us who we are right and that can be um a really beautiful thing but we also see a lot of people use that to to put other people down or try to hold them back from any sort of opportunities um you know especially like in the running industry right yeah and i promise i will get onto onto running really soon but <laughs> I, I just wanted to explore one last thing if you're if you're happy and that was um I, I suppose people will be interested in your in your own journey and perhaps when you realized that that you were non-binary and um and what that meant to you yeah I you know at first I grew up in a, in a household that was very cishet right like everyone was cisgender everyone was heterosexual and that, you know, it, in my head, it was always like, you're going to grow up, you're going to marry a woman, you're going to have kids. Like, there was this trajectory that was kind of put upon me because I was assigned male at birth, and therefore I was a boy, and I was going to, you know, be attracted to women, right? Like, this trajectory is assigned to you as soon as you're born. And, you know, it, it, it was many years in the making of me realizing, like, oh, this thing that always just felt off actually ha- there's words to describe that right there's there's a vocabulary that i can use and that took time to you know to discover but that vocabulary is really powerful and really important and so over time you know at first it, i thought oh well I, I must be gay because i'm attracted to men and thought okay yep i did it like checked the box and then all of a sudden it was like wait a second i don't think i've completely figured it out Um, Because it still feels different. It still feels weird. And so it really wasn't until my 20s that I started to really, uh, like, have these larger internal dialogues about who I was, specifically pertaining to my gender. And I was I was actually hosting my own podcast. And in that there was this this journey of, of talking to other queer individuals and learning about you know, their, their journeys um, as queer folks and, and coming into their identities and finally being proud of their identities. And in that, I started to really not only educate myself, but start to like compare a lot of these experiences and start to apply that vocabulary to my own journey and realize, oh, this, this is, this is the word that I have been feeling for 20 some years and finally felt comfortable in that, um, in using that and being able to share that and say like, this is who I am. Like, this is why it never really clicked until now. And so, you know, side note, I just, I, I always like to say it, it's just so important that not only that we have these conversation as, conversations as adults, but I think it's important that 
these conversations and this representation is around because there are people out there, there are kids out there, there are, you know, teenagers, there are people who are growing up who don't have that vocabulary or don't see that representation. I can only imagine like if I were to have had that vocabulary or that representation at a younger age, like how different my life would have been. Who's to say like how much sooner I would have come into this identity and, and this, this, you know, authenticity that I now like live and breathe. And, you know, it just makes my life so much more fulfilling and exciting. And at the end of the day, just really is a source of my own happiness. And so it's just so sad to like see all of the the legislation or or the attempts to try to remove any sort of discussion about your gender or who you are at a younger age, because that's when it's so crucial. That's when you're starting to really figure out who you are and how you fit into this world. So yeah, that was a long answer, but <laughs> it wasn't until like my twenties that I really kind of started to realize, okay, yep, this non-binary word, that, that's the thing, that's, that's the experience I've been having, you know, and I finally was able to like use that and be proud of, of that identity and who I, I was on the inside and, you know, get to really show that and, and live and breathe that on the outside. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an absolutely fascinating journey. And a few things that come into my head are how how kind of easy it is for someone like me who who is able to follow that path. You you talked about I'm born a man, I identify as a man, I'm a heterosexual. It's it's all quite easy, isn't it, to to follow mm-hmm. that, that path? And it's so much harder in society not to. And 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 kind of I'm glad you you've managed to find who you are in your twenties. I know it was still in your twenties rather than younger, but. For example, there's a a friend of mine who's a runner. I think he's somewhere in his late 40s, mid 50s. And see, I've just said he's a runner. <laughs> and I should say that they are a runner, although I, I, mm. I don't think they have completely found who they are as yet. But they're, sure. they're going yeah. through that journey now in their like in their sort of early early 50s, and um, that that must just be incredibly hard. I think. Yeah, yeah, especially. You know, I mean, what a what a wild journey to think about that too. I mean, I think about when I was younger, which was only twenty some years ago. But for someone who was fifty, like think about how different it was fifty yeah. years ago, right? Like it it is it's so exciting that we are finally at a place to have these conversations and for people to feel comfortable finally expressing who they really are. But it is also really unfortunate and and sad and heartbreaking that for some people that's happening much later in life and they finally get to this place of happiness. And if only they could have had that experience from a younger age, you know, I just, I just wish, I I wish we could be at a place where that was the reality, but it is not. And, and I, yeah, it is, it's, it's really, it's, it's also important, I think, to say that anyone's journey with their gender, their sexuality, like all of these things, A, is very personal and is going to be different for each person. It's going to happen at a different place in their life. And B, it's so fluid and it is so, um, you know, for me, like I, I was going through like all, it kind of felt like almost like uh, I was going up and down these mountains, right? Like it was like, oh, yep, I've gotten it. I figured it out. And then it was like, oh, wait, hold on. It's like, we're going back down. I don't really know. You know, it, it is this, it's this fluid journey that is going to take a lifetime to figure out. There is no like final destination of like, I did it. I figured it out because I promise you there will be another thing where you're like, oh, wait, okay. Now there's this other part of my identity that I need to kind of sort out. So I just, I just encourage folks to continue to, you know, have those internal dialogues or even, you know, find people in your life to, 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 to chat through um, how you're feeling or what you're experiencing, because it is so important that, that you are connected to that person inside um, and that, you know, you are able to have that freedom to, to move and to experience that journey um, authentically and safely. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 um, it kind of reminds me as well of an, uh, uh, the on, the ongoing nature of the journey reminds me of another conversation I had with a, a work friend who is a uh, a gay man. And he said to me, Craig, I, I, I came out a long time ago, but actually I have to come out or potentially come out every single day with every new person I meet. It doesn't end there because society still potentially treat someone like him as, as as different so he feels the need at times to to come out and say who he is and that is like with each different person that's the whole 
process of, of coming out again and coming out again and coming out again, which was probably hard enough the first time. Uh, however, I am going to ask you about running now because <laughs> you're a running podcast and you've come on to talk about that. I could talk about some of the other issues all day long because I think it's fascinating and it does, of course, marry in. But in, in terms of your your other journey, your running journey, how did you how did you get into running and and become a runner? Because I don't think you were when you were young. Yeah, no, I I remember back to like elementary school and we would, you know, you'd have your gym class and you'd have to go run the mile or have, you know, God forbid you had to go do field day. Uh, you could not pay me to be excited about those days because I loathed going out to run the mile. Like I absolutely hated it. I was honestly the kid who wouldn't even go outside for recess. I would much rather have gone into like the library and like, help the librarian sort through books or, you know, do things inside because I hate, I just hated going and being outside and being active. And a lot of that I think goes to this deeper issue, which was, you know, I, because I was assigned male at birth and I was, I was, you know, uh, I was a boy, right. They, they, that's what they, they assigned to me. Um, that meant I had to like sports, of course, and so I, my parents, you know, uh, put me into all these different sport uh, spaces. You know, I tried hockey, I tried baseball and soccer and swimming and tennis. And a lot of them, like nothing really ever stuck. And for a while, it, I was under the assumption that I was just like, nah, I just don't enjoy it. Like, you know, it's just not for me. But as I got older I, and I started to kind of reintroduce myself to different sporting spaces, I realized that I actually do enjoy sport and I enjoy being competitive and, and being active. But what was happening at that younger age was it, it was the environment in which I was being placed into that was not a safe or affirming space for people who were quote unquote different, right? Who, who didn't fit in. And now I can look back and I'm like, oh, it's because I was this non-binary kid that, you know, just was amongst all these other most likely cis boys. And it just wasn't a space that that I could thrive in. And so as I as I got older, it, it was actually kind of back in my 20s then, um, when I went to college and, and was living in Chicago, it's when I was starting to introduce activity again. You know, I started biking and rollerblading and running because to me, those were individual sports. Those were things I could just do on my own. I don't have to worry about fitting into uh, a team or into a club, I could just go out and be, you know, with myself and run and move and be active. And I really found a lot of joy in that. And then it wasn't until I moved to Seattle and joined the Seattle Front Runners, which is a, in a, an LGBTQIA plus running and walking club, where I finally realized that this thing to me that was always this individual sport or this individual activity could be done with a community, could be done as a group and, you know, a group that affirms and, uh, you know, encourages you and cheers you on, No, you know, no matter who you are, what your gender identity is or your sexual orientation is, right? Like we... Uh, we see all of those different identities coming into this space and we celebrate those. We, we encourage folks to, to bring those and, and live and, and exist authentically in those spaces. So yeah, so, so running to me really didn't come into my life until later in life. And it, it's wild, like when I was running kind of by myself and just kind of figuring things out uh, in college, you know, to me it was like, oh, a 5K, that's, that's a lot. Or oh, you know, maybe I'll run like six miles. Like, oh, that that's kind of a lot. And then I, I joined the Front Runners and uh, that was in February. So like eight, eight months later, ended up running my first marathon. And like, I, you know, going back to that kid in elementary school who couldn't, who would like, would protest to, before running the mile, thinking like that kid would run a marathon someday. I, I you know, that kid would have just laughed that off. But it is, it is really, it really speaks to the power of, of running with a community and being in a, a positive affirming space that allows you to participate authentically and what that can do, what that, what doors that can open up for an individual. Yeah. And, and that actually kind of brings me on to the next thing I wanted to talk about, which was you, you, you're, you're running now, you're, you're comfortable with your identity now. Uh, you you talk about being safe within that space within with the Seattle front runners, but presumably to go into races or to run with other people, you you have to move 
outside of that space into a, a wider running community, which I guess the question may or may not accept who you are. Um, and, and, and I suppose my question is how, how, how easy was that? How welcoming were people or did you, did you encounter any issues along the way? Or yeah. You, you know, I no, sorry. Cause you turn up at a race, you know, you're there wearing yeah. your shorts and a t-shirt. Most people probably didn't even have a clue. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it was, I, I, you know, I found the front runners and I was like, Oh wow, this is a great space. Like I, I can participate authentically and, you know, I, I'm able to build this community of, of friends and, and people that are, you know, going through similar experiences. And then that encouraged me, you know, to like run my first marathon and like get more involved in, in the larger industry. But then it was like, you're almost kind of hit in the face with, oh, wait, all the other spaces aren't necessarily like this. And that's where I started to realize that, you know, th there was this larger issue within the industry where everything is based on the gender binary of men and women, right? All the divisions and awards and prize money and apparel um, and policies and, you know, facilities, like everything is gendered, right? Even the language is is so gendered in in all of these spaces and has been that way for so long. Where do people who fall outside of that fit? right? People who are non-binary or even trans folks who are, you know, just looking to participate in these divisions with which they identify and that they want to, you know, be a part of. How do these people fit into this industry, you know, that for so long has, has shut all of us out? And not to mention then like the, the intersectionality of even the queer community with the BIPOC community or, or other marginalized identities that have also been fighting for for more space and opportunities within this sport. You know, there's just there's such a there's such a complex, I mean it's not even complex. It's very easy to understand, but like the history of this sport is has been a certain way for so long. How do we start to break it apart and and figure out how it can truly be a, a sport for for everyone to to participate in? And that's where I started to see this opportunity. You know, I could use my platform. I could use my voice to, to start to ask those questions because what I was realizing is a lot of race directors or organizers or, you know, organizations, they want to create a more inclusive space because at the end of the day, if it's a more inclusive space, more people are going to show up, right? Like that's going to increase participation. It's going to increase the... Um, your profit if you're for profit, or it's going to increase the amount that you're able to donate to the charity with which you're, you know, donating all your proceeds to, right? It At the end of the day, it's honestly a good business model to be a more inclusive space because it's going to encourage more people to participate. So they they want to make these spaces more inclusive, but a lot of the time they just don't know how, or they're not aware of the current state of, of their, of their event or their, um, you know, that space. And so they need people like myself and all of the other wonderful advocates out there to start to ask those questions and point out, Hey, you know, have you noticed how you only have men and women, men's and women's divisions? What about people like me and, and my community of non-binary folks? How do we fit into your event? Uh, and a lot of the time they're like, oh my gosh, like, yes, we, we, sh we need to open this up. Like, how do we do that? And that's where my, this, like this, uh, that, that's what encouraged me to really start to be more of an advocate and, and create resources and, and be a, um, a voice for my community to make sure that the next kid like me coming up has a space, has that representation, knows that they, you know, that they have a spot in this sport and can participate and and have a you know and, and really thrive right and have a wonderful positive experience that that's really kind of what motivated me to to get into the space yeah and your kind of answer to all of that was um was was the guide to non-binary inclusion in running which i i know you you wrote i, I you know it's a 24 page resource so i don't expect to go through the, the whole thing now <laughs> but are there some sort of main main takeouts of that you could give people quickly yeah, you know, I think at the you know there's there's so many structural things that have to be done, right? Like I mentioned the prizes and the awards and you know the the divisions and the apparel, right? Like there's so many different things. But I think base level, we really have to get to a place where organizers, participants, 
um, spectators. We have to get to get to a place where a we're not making assumptions based on what people are wearing or uh, their appearance or their name, right? Like for so long, I, I think about like race announcers, right? People who are announcing at finish lines as people cross over the finish line, you know, they see a ponytail or they see someone wearing pink and they think, oh, you know, she's coming across the, cr the, the finish line, you know, she's in the women's division. Well, but like, how do you know, right? Like, have you met this person? Do you know what their pronouns are? Have you, you know, really engaged in conversation with them? That's just how we've always operated. And I, I am encouraging folks to start to, before you make that assumption, before you start to assign all of the, because that's what we do as humans, right? Like we assign labels to people because it makes it easier to, to sort through things in our brain. Don't make that assumption right away. Um, have that conversation or ask the question or do the research to, to figure out what pronouns do does that person use? So that's, I always recommend that. I I think, you know, it, it is really challenging, but I, I, I think it what can be really helpful for people who want to be allies is to help the, the non-binary community, help the queer community by just asking those questions, right? Like asking the asking the race organizers or the people who are, you know, in charge of the event, if you start to notice things like, oh, there's not a non-binary division or, oh, you know, I notice that you just have men's and women's restrooms, help be an advocate, help us by just stating that, right? Providing that feedback. Because like I said, a lot of the time that race organizer just isn't thinking about that. And that's, that's like a huge, huge uh, way for, for allies to um, really help continue to move this movement forward yeah and, and just thinking on a, a a couple of specific practical things that kind of come into to my head i mean i'm i'm not even going to go there on the toilets because i know that's the thing that's always raised generally but but also having just done the great north run which people might know is kind of the the biggest half marathon in the uk and, and one of the biggest in the world but with sixty thousand participants there it was whether they were men women or 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 however however they were labeled most people were going to the toilet in the bushes by the end of it was so busy so kind of sort that <laughs> problem out before you start worrying about everything else and organizers but yeah that's that's an aside but um i mean one thing that comes to mind is is kind of on uh race records and things like that you you, you traditionally i suppose have, would have a, a a men's record and a and a, and a women's record uh if you do you then sort of add a a a, a a, a, I don't know, a non-binary record, and does that vary depending on whether that person was assigned as a, a, a man or a woman when they were born? And also, how does that work in time in terms of like qualifying times? Um, I, I have to say, I saw on Twitter this week you having a bit of a, a back and forth with somebody about the Boston Marathon on that. I mean, I kind of say it's an interesting question. I, I suspect it's a lot easier than some people make out because their own their own kind of bigotry make, makes them want to make it a lot harder. Yeah. Okay, yeah, big question. Uh, yeah, it was it was a it was a wild week on the social medias, and uh, you know, it just continues to show the 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 hatred and the the bigotry that is out there uh, that we're continuing to fight. But enough on that. <laughs> um, what I would say is that when when organizers are implementing a non-binary division, I typically will tell them think about all the things that you do for the existing divisions, right? The men's and women's divisions. What do you do? Is there a finishing tape? Do you do podiums? Do you have, you know, on your social media, are you announcing the, the top three people in that division? Um, what are all those typical practices that you have in place? Apply those to any new division that you add, i.e. the non-binary division. Sure, for some races, that division might be much smaller to start, um, which is fine because we're this division is just being implemented. That doesn't mean that there aren't non-binary runners out there. There are actually many, um, but they've never had a space. And and I would I would argue that a lot of them are actually participating within the current men's and women's divisions because they want to participate, but that's their only option. So this provides an avenue for those folks to to really participate in a division that that fits with with who they are. But the, at, the, at the end of the day, right, it, it's thinking about all those things that you already are doing and applying that to this new division. You know, there, there are so many different things, like you mentioned, the qualifying times and um, doing uh, uh, what did you said, records. Right. And I typically err on the side of I recommend just 
doing it all, right? That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have like a top three in each age category throughout the entire non-binary division, right? Like it might be a little smaller to start and that's okay. But starting from this place of we're going to create a um, an equitable experience for the folks in this division, just like the other two divisions, I think that's the mentality that you should be entering that, you know, discussion or, or conversation with, because that's what we want at the end of the day is just to be treated like all the other participants, but just not be forced into a gendered category that does not represent who we are. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I answered all those questions. <laughs> yeah, I think so. The, the, I mean, I don't really think it matters, but we, we uh, in terms of like qualification times, it, it, you know, mm. uh, if you would a, I don't know, would a would a would a non-binary qualification time be set as the men's time, the women's time, somewhere in the middle, uh, the men's time if you were assigned as a man at birth, and and so on, or am I overcomplicating things? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I know that there are some larger organizations right now that are starting to implement those, right? Like you, you mentioned the Boston Marathon, and there's some other ones out there that, you know, like the New York and, and Chicago Marathons, I believe, have them. And I typically just say, you know, I, I think it going with the the qualifying time that's inclusive of the existing divisions, right? So a lot of the time that is the, the women's qualifying time, which is inclusive of the men's qualifying time. Um, now people are going to have all their opinions about this. I think it's important that we continue to work through what those qualifying times are based on results um, and continuing to kind of sh fit, you know, ship, oh gosh, shift and like mold what those are based on how, you know, what we're noticing with participation, right? I It's, there's there are so many studies going on right now you know there, there's all this talk about like oh well men are faster and women are slower and that's just you know biologically a fact but what we realize is there's actually so much we don't know about all of the other factors right like everyone's always using testosterone as like the main factor and predictor of, of how fast you are going to be as a runner but there are so many other things that go into that specifically like on the, the social side, right? Like culturally, like how much access do you have to training facilities or to, um, you know, a, 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 what do you call it? A, a, a nutrition or a good nutrition plan, right? In preparation for that race, you know, there, there's so much focus on the, um, the testosterone part, right? The biological part, but there's also so many other factors that are going to affect a participant's ability, you know, to, 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 to succeed and to be fast or to, you know, um, really show up and, and bring their best self to that race. So I think it, it just, it, it asks for, um, or it sets up this larger conversation about, you know, how we are dividing people within this industry, right? How we are, using gender, which we know is just this larger, complex spectrum to, to divide people, is there another solution, right? I don't have this answer, but I ask it all the time. Is there another solution for how we classify and separate folks in this, uh, in this industry? Um, I think, you know, we might get to a place where as the non-binary division starts to grow, do we have to start to kind of divide it into you know, subdivisions or areas, you know, like, we just don't know what we what we know right now is that non binary people are not included in this industry that has men's and women's divisions. And so we our first step is just creating a space for them. Once we figure that out, once we are able to get, you know, a majority of races to have that space, then we can start to figure out what that next step is, right? It is going to be a, a, you know, phased uh, solution and process but there are so many races and, and people out there who won't even like agree on the fact that non-binary people exist, right? Let alone the creation of a division for them, right? We have to, we have to address that first. And once that is done, then we can continue the conversation and figure out like, what is, what's the next step, right? Like is, is dividing based on gender the, the right answer, the right solution? I don't know. I think that's really interesting, actually. I think those those sort of questions are 
relevant and valid, but ultimately the, the big question is how do we get non-binary people able to feel comfortable in these races? And, and ultimately, if if uh, 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 one cis male feels a little bit of their nose put out of joint because somebody has a slightly generous <laughs> qualifying time, well, who gives a shit? And <laughs> excuse the language, but frankly, it doesn't matter. And I would just add really quickly that like, so much of the conversation is about the the top finishers, right? The prize money, the awards, you know, the qualifying times. That's for the quote unquote fast runners, right? The the small percentage at the top. When you have a race that, like you mentioned, was like what sixty thousand people, that is the smallest group of people at the top that we're like getting stuck on, right? Like, oh well, we can't do this work because you know of whatever it's going to do to the top three or the the qualifying. But think about all of the people, the the fifty five thousand other people, right, in that race that might actually get an opportunity to just participate and have that joy of running in a division that matches their gender identity. That to me is the important part of this. And we can't stop or, or kind of refrain or uh, refrain from doing any of this work because we think, Oh, you know, someone's going to get more money at the top or, Oh, you know, this person's going to qualify or this person's not like at the end of the day, I'm just trying to get this industry to realize there are so many people out there that just want to participate as their authentic selves. And right now they cannot. Jake, I think it's all absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for going through that so comprehensively and for joining me today on the Running Tales podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. I uh, I really enjoyed the conversation and hopefully it wasn't too, you know, too wordy or uh, uh, hopefully it was all, com- you know, uh, comprehensible. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I definitely think so. I think it'd be really interesting for people and, and hopefully uh, get people and race directors thinking a little bit more. So fantastic. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks again to Jake Fedorowski for joining me today on the Running Tales podcast. I hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as I did. There was so much more we could have gone into just time got to us in the end there. If you did enjoy this week's podcast, we'd love you to give us a positive rating or review wherever you listen. It does really help other people to find the podcast and listen to stories like Jake's. Thank you again for listening and I'll see you next week for another Running Tales podcast.